Matthew 26, 6 to 9. Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also wast with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. When he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him, and said unto him that were there, this fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. After a while came unto him that stood by, and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them, for thou speech betrayeth thee. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. And Peter answered the word of Je remembered, and Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him before the cock crow, Thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. Then I'd have you look also in the book of Luke, the twenty second chapter, fifty fourth verse. Then took they him and led him, and brought him into the high priest house. And Peter followed afar off. And they had kindled afar in the midst of the hall, and were set down together. Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid beheld him, and as he sat by the fire, and earnestly looked upon him, and said, This man also was also with him. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. And after a little while another saw him, and said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. About the space of one hour, another confidently affirmed, saying of a truth, This fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately, while he yet spake, the cock crew. The Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter went out and wept bitterly. Reading from the 22nd chapter of Luke. Enter into the courts of the Lord with thanksgiving. Pay thy vows unto the Lord with thanksgiving. Anyone got a offering of thanksgiving? We'll wait a moment for it. Call your attention to another verse or two in the 31st of the 22nd chapter of Luke. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to sift you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. He said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day, before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. On the Lord's day before the other conference on the Sunday morning, if you recall, I spoke to you on watch out for that ghost. This morning I want to talk to you about this, watch out for the crowing rooster. We talked to you about on that Sunday of the beginning of the conference of how that the ghost frightened people. Now in the midst of all of it, there was Christ. 
Christ was the thing that determined that it was not a ghost, but it was he. That calmed the storm, that stabilized the disciples. We have here a very interesting story. Jesus is headed to the cross. He's on his way to the crucifixion. In the midst of it, the disciples are trying to be loyal and faithful. And I talked to you Wednesday night about watch and pray. Now Jesus is simply saying to Peter, this thing did not slip upon Peter accidentally. He was warned, he was had plenty of warning. Jesus said, Satan is desired to sift thee as wheat. He is desired to have you that he may sift his wheat. Do you get the significance of it? Wheat. He didn't say he is desired to have thee and sift thee as chaff. A lot of difference between the chaff and the wheat. The chaff is the husk that covers the wheat. And there's a lot of other chaff that looks like wheat also. We find other things that look like wheat with the chaff. Just to shove, take it and look at it, it looks like, if you please, wheat, but when you get the chaff off, it's not wheat. So Jesus is simply saying to Peter, Satan is desired to have you and sift you as wheat. Now it does not hurt wheat to sift it. It only polishes the wheat. It only gets rid of the chaff. And we find Jesus simply saying, I prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Now notice, Jesus didn't pray for Peter not to get sifted. He just prayed that his faith wouldn't fail while the sifting's going on. It don't hurt Christians to go through a sifting. It'll get the chaff out of us. It'll get the things in us that ought to come out of us. And then Jesus said, Peter, when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. What is the matter with Peter? He is too dead sure. He is too determined that he wasn't going to do nothing wrong. He'd go to prison. He died for the Lord, but so far as denying the Lord, he wasn't going to do it. Jesus is simply saying, when you get converted, when you get convinced that you can, then you can strengthen some of the other fellows that's too dead set on some things. When you get converted, strengthen the brethren. Now, the first thing that happens to Peter in this deal is that he follows afar so off. Let's look in Luke 22, 54. Then took they him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house. And Peter followed afar so off. There's the thing that we must begin to recognize, the thing that caused Peter to get in the position he finds himself in, intimidated, embarrassed, hurt, having to weep and through bitter tears and come to repentance was that he got to following far off. He got to lagging behind. And as a result, it automatically placed him in the crowd that was against Christ. Any time we follow Christ at a distance, any time we back up on following the Lord, 
it automatically identifies us with the wrong crowd, puts us in the wrong environment, and gives us the wrong influence. Now, mind you one thing. John did not have to deny Jesus Christ. Nobody had to ask John, are you one of them? Nobody accused John of being one of them. Everybody knew that John the Beloved was one of the disciples. He went in with him. He said, there's no need of me begging. They know me, I know them. The chief priests know me, and I know them. And so as a result, you never find John, the beloved of having to repent of his backslidden state. You know why? He stayed so close in with Jesus that nobody raised the question about his loyalty. Nobody raised the question about his identity with Christ. Nobody accused him of anything. They just accepted the fact that he sold out lock, stock, and barrel with Jesus, and there's no need of us tampering and fooling with him because he's one of them. Now I raise the question, where are you following? Are you living enough like Jesus and living identified with Jesus to the extent that it's accepted by everybody that you're a follower of Christ? Unashamedly, openly, proudly, I'm identified with Jesus. Nobody has to run around and have a investigation committed to see whether I'm living for Jesus or not. A lot of folks, you have to ask them why they're living for Christ. A lot of folks, you have to have somebody go investigate to see. These other folks that so identified with Jesus Christ, so known as a Christian that nobody raises a question. It's accepted. He's Christian. She's Christian. That's where it ought to be with all of us. But many follow afar off. And when we start falling afar off, that places us automatically with the wrong crowd puts us in the wrong environment and brings about the pressure that makes us do things we oughtn't to do. The influences and the environments of it. And we must recognize one thing. If the Bible teaches anything, my brother, sister, it teaches the progressiveness of sin. Sin is a progressive thing. We stop to realize nobody becomes, for example, a hard liquor drinker. They first become a social drinker, a beer drinker, a wine bibber. And soon it creates such an appetite that they have to satisfy the demand for hard liquor in their systems. In other areas, same principle, the progressiveness of sin, the dance, the average person looks upon it and sees no harm in it. But soon it will demand sex desires and sex relationships and disgrace. Falling or fall off. Take, for example, the bowling alleys. A lot of folks don't see a thing wrong with it, but my friends, it puts them in the wrong crowd in the wrong environment. 
Feel down and go to New Albany and look over there at those young people on Friday nights and Saturday nights. I passed by there the other night and seen a girl laying out there openly to boys on the fend of a car. You hear me, my friends? When you get a far off, it puts you with the wrong crowd, puts you in the wrong environment, and brings on the pressure that makes you deny God. As we face it, sin is a progressive thing. John did not have to deny. Jesus did not have to pray for John in that capacity. Satan is desired to sift me as wheat, not as chaff. Peter was saved. Peter was a disciple. But the devil don't care about the crowd that's done sold out to him. The devil's not after the chaff of the community. The devil's not after the chaff of society. The devil's after the wheat. He's got the chaff ready for the furnace. He's got, if you please, the tares are going to the furnace. The devil knows the tares are headed to the furnace. The devil, the devil knows that the chaff is going to be blown out and burned out. But the one the devil's after is the wheat. We stop to recognize he's not concerned about the chaff crowd. He's got the, his wind blowing them to the right point of destruction. But the one that he's worried about is the wheat. Satan is designed to sift thee as wheat. Not as trash. The devil don't care for that crowd. He's not worried about the crowd that's gone his way that's no more than tares among the wheat and the chaff and the wheat. He's worried about you who are the wheat. If he can put you through a sifting. And my friends, Jesus did not pray for us not to be sifted. He prayed that the faith wouldn't fail while the sifting going. And said, when you get through and your faith is strengthened, then strengthen the brethren. Keep this one thing in mind. Jesus knew that Peter was going to remain wheat. That regardless of the sifting, he's going to remain wheat. What about you? Does he know that you're going to remain wheat? Are you wheat? Or chaff? All right, let's notice the progressiveness of sin in this thing. First, Peter followed afar off. But John was close enough that everybody could identify him with Jesus. That's where it ought to be with me and with you. It's a tragedy when people have to ask you whether you're a Christian because of where you hang out and who you associate with and the places you go. In other words, it's just a lot of places they, uh, the world don't expect to see Christians. You know it. I know it. A lot of things the world don't expect of you Christians. They expect Christians to be dressed in goddess apparel. They expect Christian men to be able to lift up holy hands and pray. 
how are they finding me in you? Here they are. First of all, he stops in the courtyard. And when he stops in the courtyard, you got the officers. You got, in other words, the false teachers. And the false doctors begin to teach and preach and compromise and say there's no harm in this and no harm in that. We've got a lot of pussyfoot and backslapping and tickling preachers and Sunday school teachers today that don't teach against sin. No need to whip them the devil around them. And when those who come in among them hear that, then that pushes them further out of the crowd. Then let somebody take a stand. And they say, well, he's radical. He's old timing. He don't know we're having a change in age. He's a radical. It's those false prophets that come to speak evil of the ones that have tried to stand for the truth down through the corridors of time. And then young and old together say, well, I don't understand. I don't understand. That's what Peter said. I don't understand what you're talking about. When you say this is, are you one of Jesus' disciples? I don't understand what you're talking about. I don't know what you mean. That's what he said. In other words, a lot of folks say, Well, I don't understand what you're talking about. I don't understand where you're headed. I don't know what you mean. No, the thing of it is you're just a pushy foot around and compromising and being sympathetic with sin, and you don't want to understand. That's the whole story. Folks just don't understand your stand against sin and unrighteousness. They just don't understand. No, Peter didn't understand either. You know why? He's run with the wrong crowd. And he didn't understand. And when you get to run with the wrong crowd and hang it on the outskirts, of trying to be a Christian, trying to be religious, you are not going to understand why the truth is preached and why it stood for either. Notice. Peter then began to warm his feet with that crowd. Began to fellowship with that crowd. Rather than Jesus and John. Here's what happens when you start falling or fall off. You get with a crowd that just don't understand. I don't understand who you're talking about. I don't understand what you're talking about. And won't be long till you start fellowship with that don't understand crowd. And then you won't understand either. Because the devil will wrap up your mind and sear your conscience with a heart and burn out your convictions and you won't know what you be understanding. Face it this morning. The reveals. Fellowship in the devil's crowd. Don't see nothing wrong with drinking socially. Don't see nothing wrong with dancing. Don't see nothing wrong with the car parties. Don't see nothing wrong with the pool halls. Don't see nothing wrong with the skating rinks and the wild places, the mixed bathing ponds. Don't see nothing wrong. With a bow and that, oh no, I don't see nothing wrong. You know why? He's a proud to win. Amen. That's the reason you don't see. 
You don't understand. It's the environment you're in. It's who you're fellowshipping with. It's their influence. You don't find dedicated, separated, praying Christians in those places. It's not worried about you. When I say dedicated, consecrated, I'm not talking about somebody that can run around and make a little Bible talk around and talk about being religious and then not live up to it. We got a lot of folks who around, put on Bible talks and Bible this and Bible that, and they hang out at the pool halls, hang out at the door house, and hang out at the skate rink, hang out at the rich vacant park, and they don't understand when somebody preaches against sin. I don't care how much religious front you put on. If it don't get you out of that crowd, you're a hypocrite. Just face the truth this morning. Next thing, he stopped outside the gate. Moved out. Servants of sin. Begin to accuse him. First time he said, I don't understand what you're talking about. Next time they begin to accuse him. And he said, I don't know him. I don't belong to that crowd. I did not. Why? He's got back out of the gate now. He was just up here, falling afar off. But now he's got back with the crowd that's going to put on pressure. He's got to deny them. Because he can't stay with the crowd that he's running with and acknowledge the Lord. Now, would you hear me this morning? We've got folks that's gone so far out and so far to far out. They're denying the Lord and the church and they don't want to stand for it. And when they get in their cussing, benching, sexy crowd, get with the homosexuals and the Elizabethans and the adulterers, then my friends, I tell you, they deny God. They say, I don't know God. I don't know that crowd. I don't know that murder that I don't know this church. Why? The crowds. The crowds. That's who it is. Got away from authority. Got away from other places. God. The servants sin begin to accuse and accuse and make fun and pressure until they have to lie that the Lord and the Lord to stay with the gang. I don't know that. I don't know about the church. I don't know about God. I don't, I don't like that preacher no how. All right. And the next thing is the bystanders. We first got the world on the feet. He did for the crowd as far. Next thing is outside of you. Next thing he finds himself with a crowd of people. Multitude bystanders. The whole community is looking on. The whole community is saying, I thought you was a Christian. I thought you was a church member. I thought 
you to preach your teacher and deacon. You've already said you didn't understand. You've already denied. Now then, in order to make it to more impressive, you begin to push and stop and say, I don't even know nothing about it. I don't know nothing about it. Why? Putting on pressure. One of them preacher followers, huh? One of them church believers, huh? One of them Jesus men, huh? Start serving the Lord occasionally. That's fallen far off. Then eventually they'll quit going to church and don't want to hear the truth anymore. They'll quit. And the line up of the people of the world. You can't get a more vivid picture than God can give it to a people. Jesus said, wait a minute. When Satan gets through sifting, you can strengthen the breath of man. All I have to do is get him to the wrong crowd. Get him parked on the backslid and he begin to follow, follow for all. He begin to fellowship with Christ. Listen, all the devil's got to get you to do is get you fellowship from the wrong bunch of people. Hanging out in the wrong places. And you get to where, well, I just don't understand what's the matter with me. I don't understand what's the matter with so and so. I tell you what's the matter. They're away from God. And when they're all on the altar, all sold out for God, they do understand. I don't have to worry about what's the matter with somebody. But you just hang on and get a little further away, and the next thing you know, you'll be stomping and swearing and cussing that you don't even know. There he is. Great crowd of bystanders, homeowners, all finest criticized. God hated church leaders, preach angels. Some of the wrong crowd now. And to save face, the keep being made spoiled and called chicken and called stupid and silly, I'll just stop my feet and throw me a pit and say, I don't know the Lord. I swear I don't know nothing about that stuff. The rooster's going to crawl. See the pressure of God. Who's living that now? Peter saw Jesus looking at him. Peter saw Jesus looking at him. He didn't see this crowd anymore. But he saw Christ. And he broke down and went to weeping. And went back and said, Lord, forgive me. Help me. But he
hear me? If he hadn't saw Jesus, he'd still be willing to cry. Until we look back at Jesus, we keep hanging with the clouds. I'm desiring to sift me as wheat, Satan said. Jesus said it about Satan. And Jesus said, when thou art converted, straight to the bread. What Jesus know? That Peter was saved, and that when he really got shoot down, he's going to repent and be used. Which is simply saying this, brother, sister. I will chastise those whom I love. You are saved! The rooster's gonna crow. May it crawl through a few. May it crawl through the sick man. May it crawl through tragedy. Otherwise, the rooster can crawl besides the one in the tree. Woman raining and she said. Oh, brother, pray that God won't do nothing to my husband. I know you're a local woman, but pray that God won't do nothing with him. I said, I can. I'm praying against God. He's gone out and committed adultery. He's going to pass over what God said, sir. God said, I'll chastise those who will suffer to be so that the scripture may be fulfilled. Brother, sister, we've got to suffer something. And when God stops, he don't need me to wish my breath for you, God. You don't know. Suffer to be so that the scripture might be fulfilled. You go away from God. The tragedy is coming with your sins. If it's wheat, they're going to repent. Get back around. And if they don't repent, it is a chance to start the house. Let me raise a personal question with you. Can you get by with it? When you do wrong and act wrong before God, do you get by with it? Does God let you go? Does God make an exception to you? I will chastise those whom I love, and if you will not touch me, then you're bastards. I'll make the rooster crow. And there's no crow to the rooster. There's no salvation there. You think God will make an exception of you or me or someone dear to you or dear to me? I don't believe it. When I get away from God and get in the wrong crowd and get denying the Lord, I have to suffer. What about you? There has been an exception. Does God make exceptions? Does God show any partiality? What about it? Repentance always comes. Peter saw the Lord. He lost sight of this bunch. So the Lord. And he went out and went bitterly. If we can keep looking at that crowd, 
from the outside and never see the Lord. There's something radically wrong. If the rust of our clothes has never been in the wheel, it's about to tear. Tears, it was tearing in the wheel. And the second time's come and go, go, blow the chaff and let it go. Pull up the tears and let them out. But my friends, before God, if it's weak, then there will be a time of repentance. Get right with you. Let's see the Lord. Let's face it. And watch out for the cock to crow. You get a far off. Sin is progressive. I just don't understand all of these things. Next thing is, I don't know the Lord. Next thing is, you get with the stomping, cussing crowd that don't want to know that. But God won't lead out there stomping and cussing with Jesus and look at you. You will repent if you're saved. If you're not, you can just keep on stomping and cussing. I had a mother to call me just this week and said, My son's gone back and won't go to church. He's gone back on God. And he doesn't know what he's saved or not, man. I said, Well, what else do you expect? You've got to fall away from God. What else do you expect him to and he's mixed up. He's confused. Why? He got far enough back with the crowd. The crowd he's run with. The business he's in and so on. He didn't understand. I just don't understand all this Christian stuff. Then he got with a crowd that gave him to curse and drink. And he had to deny the Lord and give over. And the next thing he's plumbed back with the crowd. But don't be in God. Don't tell it about God. And there's a result. He's all the way back. But if you don't see the face of Jesus pretty soon, you can recognize the fact that he is lost. I just don't believe God leaves us back there, that crowd always. There's a day of repentance. Watch out for the crowing rooster. Feed on crow. You need salvation. Feel the wheat. You got a little too far off. You kept backing up because of the progressiveness of sin. You do a little sin, and then it progresses on you. And you do a little more, and it progresses, and you do more, and it takes you know, we put you on it. The best thing to do is do like Peter did. Now let me say, if you're saved, you will. This book teaches it. When thou art converted, strengthen the breath. Jesus said, Peter, you're going to get away, but you're going to be converted when you get back. You're going to find out you can't do what you want to do out there. And you're going to have to come back to me, and you tell other folks. And so, my brother or sister, watch out for the crowing rooster. If you say, young or old, you go back, the rooster's going to crow. And when it crows, you'll repent with bitter tears. And if there's no repentance, there's no wheat. No wheat. We're going to sing a stanza. If you've been falling afar off, you've been thrown in the wrong environment with the wrong crowd, and you need to get back to God, it's a good time to come this way.